This is the Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. The following is a presentation by anarchists from Ukraine and Belarus, alongside a question and answer portion with the audience, conducted in part via live translation services. The discussion, much like previous discussions by anarchists supporting anti-authoritarians joining the armed defenses against the Russian invasion, was interrupted a number of times by pacifists or others who didn't want the discussion of the complexities of joining territorial defense forces to have space. Those interruptions were mostly not recorded, as they happened off mic, but you'll hear a reaction to them. I felt the audio was important to share here with the audience, particularly in spite and because of the silencing efforts. So I recorded this during the 2023 Senemie Anarchist Gathering on the 105th anniversary of the first anarchist and anti-authoritarian Labor International, following the purges by Marxists and Blanquists. Like the first one in 1872, hosted by the Jura Federation, this gathering was hosted in a small village called Senemie, with a population of about 4,000 people, being nearly doubled in size over the course of five days of workshops, concerts, discussions, food, film showings, and tablings. So you can find reflections from some of the folks uh, at crimethink.com of folks who attended the Senemier conference, and I'll link those in the show notes, alongside in the show notes also links to recordings from live multilingual radio broadcasts throughout the event and the website for the gathering where you'll find a list of happenings from that week. Hopefully in the near future, maybe, you'll be able to find recordings of the presentations that got recorded during this event, such as this one that I'm presenting here, uh, somewhere in video, somewhere in audio. The languages that they were presented in generally are either French, German, English, Spanish, uh, or Italian, or some mixture of those. So uh, if you want to hear me reflecting on how the event overall went, you can check out an upcoming episode of It's Going Down podcasts while speaking with my friend and former co-host Scott Branson about how the book fair here in Asheville went. Okay, um, thank you, and hello, and welcome to our event. I have a couple of pre-announcements before we come to what we're actually doing. First of all, there's a live stream. Um, It's going to be blurry, like it's this camera over there, but no panic, nobody's going to be recognized. Then I would like to announce again that this is an anarchist camp, and it lives by all our solidarity, mutual aid, and respect. So everybody who did not yet sign in for a volunteer shift, please do so after the event. You can do this in the Espace Noir and uh, help to make that event happen in the way we all want because there are not enough people helping. And as anarchists, I think I don't have to explain you what mutual aid and solidarity means. Okay, then we have a mailing list for people who would like to support um, us in our struggle. It's on the info table over there and we kind of have a newsletter. So we can, you can sign up with your email and can, can uh, yeah, get further information or uh, join us in whatever way. Okay, um, before we start with our talk, we would like to commemorate commemorate from one hand to our comrades who lost their lives in this war, but also we would like to commemorate all people who suffered from Russian terror and lost their lives rather in battle or were murdered and tortured by Russian imperialist occupiers. And for that, we would ask you all for a minute of silence.
thank you. Okay, um, my name is Nina and I am active with ABC Dresden and I will try to moderate the first part of the event. First of all, we would like to thank everybody who support um, our struggle since the very first day or joined later. We are really grateful for that and we will talk today about the critical points. So it was important for us to mention that whatever we say, of course, does not apply to everybody. So we would thank uh, in the first place all people who are supporting. Mm, the people are here right now on this podium, like one person is coming back soon, she needed a moment after this kind of incidents at the beginning. Our people I know uh, quite long and we were used to do solidarity work even before the war. So yeah, they actually are awesome comrades and gave me the possibilities in the last year to learn a lot and see different perspectives. And um, we had the possibility to actually plan what we're going to do before the war started, because it was clear the war will come. It was kind of visible. And so we talked before how we would support our comrades in Ukraine. And um, out of this one and a half year now, kind of, um, we worked together. We faced a lot of challenges in the solidarity work. Also among us, of course. I mean, there's always things to discuss. The world is not white and black, rather than that's really complex and we have to figure it out. But we did, and we are still together. And yeah, I encourage everybody to discuss. And we can shout, but we also should listen to each other. Okay, I'm going to start with introducing our podium. And I'm going to start with Masha to my right side. Um, Masha is part of a group of uh, Belarusian anarchists in Warsaw who try to spread anarchist idea among the Belarusian diaspora in Warsaw, which uh, grew big after the uprising in 2020 in Belarus. Then next to Masha, there is Nastya. Nastya is a member of Solidarity Zone. This is an organization who is organizing prisoner support for people doing militant actions against the war machine in Russia with anti-militaristic and anti-imperial views. Nastya is uh, not talking on behalf of the organization. We just wanted to um, show where, what, where she's organizing right now. Then I have on the left Mira. She is an activist of ABC Kiev, who is supporting political refugees from neighboring country of Ukraine since 15 years. And she's also an activist in the Solidarity Collectives, who is supporting fighting comrades and doing humanitarian aid. And on the left is Baris. He is a member of ABC Belarus, who is supporting, the group is supporting prisoners since 2008 from inside and outside of the country. So we will have different blocks of topics, and afterwards we will open um, the discussion for the audience. Okay, and um, we're going to start with a more regional perspective. You all know that the war began in 2014, and this beginning of the war in 2014 affected the relations between Russian and Ukrainian groups. So we want to dive at first in the question of solidarity between actually these two places uh, where basically the war is inflicted and happening. And I would start with you, Mira, and ask um, to give us your perspective on that. Um, yeah, I can say that we were quite close with uh, Russian collectives be before 2014. And during, uh, I mean, also, also, also after, but not uh, less and less, I would say. There were, there were several reasons between them. For sure, it was the fact that it was much more difficult to travel between each other after war exploded, after what happened. But also it was that I would say that we both, on both sides, were more or less ignoring what is going on. We were concentrated on our usual like anarchist topics and not really reacting on war much. And I would say that we still had some connections 
my group, we were also running like big anarcho-feminist festival with the aim to keep these connections. But yeah, it was um, getting more weak, less people in contact, so losing uh, like losing common topics, losing common discussions. And I would say that it was also a couple of attempts to agree kind of anti-war actions on both sides. But we didn't have uh, interest from the groups on Russian side to whom at least we tried to talk. And then uh, for the moment, uh, yeah, it's no relations between groups. It's more like personal relations with some exact comrades somewhere like in Russia or outside Russia. And yeah, for a pity, it's like that. Um, I think one of the problems is also that for people who grew up uh, in big empire, it's uh, kind of difficult to see that not everything is going around this. Like, not everything what is connected to this empire is about this empire, kind of like kind of like this. And I think people do a lot of work to, some people, like mo many people do a lot of work to rethink about that, because in Ukraine we also never thought about this colonial experience. We didn't ever have a kind of normal discussion on it. It just popped up now. And yeah, I mean, it's now complicated, but I hope that maybe events like this will make more connections and more possibilities to work together and kind of go through this experience together. Thank you. Maybe, Nastya, you want to share your perspective? Uh, yeah, uh, my perspective is, uh, on the one hand, is uh, very similar, and on another one, quite different, because uh, when uh, the Russian invasion into Ukraine started in uh, 2014. I wasn't active uh, yet as an anarchist, uh, but uh, I, I was and still I am an artist and uh, I saw these uh, connections in art scene also. And for me, there was uh, a lack of uh, maybe interest, mostly from Russian side, what exactly happens on the occupied territories, uh, what is going on with our colleagues, with our friends. And uh, it was a lot of possibilities actually for us, for artists and activists, to make a dialogue, but I can't say that we used it every time we may. I wanted to uh, share like an idea that uh, recently popped up in my head about this like the connections that were actually destroyed by everything that happened after Maidan in um, 2014 because um, I started being active in like 2008 and since then I remember that there was always like camps organized either in Russia or in Ukraine or in Belarus where like hundreds of comrades would come from the three countries and after the war it was not any more possible to for the Russian comrades especially males to go to Ukraine uh, and also I think uh, and, and that's why we kind of started going all to Russia. So it was more like your Russian-Belarusian uh, relationship from then on. And after that, the Putin regime got like more um, repressive, let's say. So it, uh, we started doing only underground camps. And after some time, it just stopped at all. So for, for many years, and also like in Belarus, it was not even possible to organize, uh, to invite comrades to be just arrested uh, in the forest or something like this. So I think uh, it's just important to mention that this, um, even though Belarus back then was not a part of this conflict, let's say, unlike now, uh, we as the movement suffered the cost of it. And I think 
also what is important to mention that we also, as a Belarusian movement, never speculated on how much we are dependent on the, or like how much the Russian movement is the opinion makers for the whole region. So it's like it's, we are only consuming rather than producing or putting uh, knowledge together. And um, this is why when there was repression in Russia, it also kind of reverberated on the Belarusian movement. So everything started being like less and less, less literature, less connections, less Russian uh, en activists lost the memberships and it was clearly. So I would say that by the time of the war, the, all the three countries were basically quite de de like dispersed. So everybody was like doing their own thing and there was no really a big cooperation going on, like Amira said, on the group level, just some people knowing each other. Okay, um, thank you. We would like now to, uh, to look in a bit wider context and the question of solidarity between the region and Europe and the world. And we had different um, challenges. We kind of figured out in our discussions we want to um, touch right now. And one of the first topics which actually really often came up was the problem of subjectivity which means that actually the, the perspectives of Ukrainian was often not taken in account. And people actually try to reach out, even before the war, to share the situation in Ukraine and about the Ukrainian movement. Um, yeah, and had different experiences with that. And maybe, Boris, you want to start with yours? Right. So, if you were at our talk um, a couple of days ago, uh, we were talking that it, the information is very important in the questions of solidarity. The information is very important in understanding how the things are working. And uh, for us, as we've seen like the, the war basically brewing into something bigger in, 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 in Russia, on, also in Belarusian borders, um, we understood that uh, we actually have to put a lot of efforts in helping comrades in Ukraine to spread information and like to spread uh, knowledge of what is happening there. Um, at that point, um, ABC Belarus was also part of international of anarchist federations, um, and we started like a I think a weekly or something like biweekly calls with the people from the federations from around uh, Europe mostly. And uh, the, the first calls were kind of people were interested in knowing what the things are happening, but slowly, like step by step, with uh, more aggression inside of the information sphere, uh, we ended up actually with the people shouting at the person who was doing these calls from our side and so on, and also ended up in the situations where people from the Europe, European countries, um, Italy, like south of uh, Europe, right? We're basically reproducing the Russian propaganda in those calls. Like you're basically sitting with the comrades and you're saying, okay, this is and this is the current situation. And the comrades are just as if they are copy pasting Russia today on you. Um, that was very shocking. And that's kind of like a thing uh, for us that showed that um, we are in this uh, information warfare where certain anarchist circles are ready to actually disregard um, their comrades from the region in favor of their own reality, in favor of their own perception of the reality, right? So they have certain narratives that they were fed in the last um, eight years, what, nine years already since 2014. And when those narratives were questioned by the comrades from the regions, um, it became very hard to find a common language. And at the end of the day, those conversations stopped. Like, we didn't have enough energy and motivation to actually talk to the people who became a clear wall closed, right? And I think for me, this is an example of um, how people don't want to hear, right? A lot of people are saying who are, um, have their perspective, strong perspectives towards um, Ukraine or many other regions. Um, those people say, oh, we want to have a conversation. We really want to have a discussion. And I think some of you have seen how discussions went in the last days where people were shouting and, and articulating and so on and so forth. Um, 
And for us, it became clear as well that certain groups of anarchists do not want to hear their comrades. They don't want to hear the reality. They want to stick to this kind of like a very simple version of the world that exists in this very nice place that is called Europe, um, Western Europe, Southern Europe, uh, Northern Europe or whatever. This became like a huge barrier in, in general in, in the work of solidarity because you can't do solidarity based on the false information. You can't do solidarity uh, on the false narrative. You cannot do solidarity work and, and raise solidarity based on this, you know, like a shaky platform that has nothing under it. Um, yeah, so like for me, that was actually the point where we got confronted to that because for us, like for Belarusians, this was not a point for a very long time as the Belarusian regime is not so strong in disinformation. Um, though we've heard that Belarus is socialist state uh, from some comrades who never heard about Belarus before. Uh, but yeah, like disinformation is a, is a very serious weapon against solidarity that is used by states a lot. And although we are a very small movement, um, and we might think, okay, Putin doesn't think about anarchists. In reality, we are actually affected by that disinformation a lot. Yeah, I think um, we heard this actually yesterday also on the talk um, about Iran, where comrades were saying that there are certain narratives which perceive certain states or regions as anti-imperialist and then follow some kind of old narratives. So um, I think we kind of face this here as well. Um, Mira, I want to hear your um, experiences with these problems. Mm, I think that for me, one of the worst um, points in this is that um, I don't know how it happens because, I mean, we have collectives in Ukraine, we have active seeing, we have our websites, we have our resources, it's possible to talk to us, we are open to make speeches. From the beginning of full-scale invasion, I made almost 50 talks when people were like willing to listen and one where they didn't will to listen. So, um, I mean, we are very open to share our experience and our position, but uh, a lot of collectives, they just don't need us. They don't need uh, any of our experience. They are experts themselves on our topic. So we are not subjects. It would be like, I don't know, like as a feminist, I feel like if it would be men who will make statements about feminism without like cis male, without really any of other people asking, that's, I feel the same when it's some collective somewhere, who knows where, like far away in Europe. They are very privileged in my opinion because having a European passport for Ukraine, you know, it's like, wow, they are having all the resources like internet, like possibility to communicate, but they just don't need us. I'm coming to events like this and people knowing there are people from Ukraine here, they have discussions on the topics about Ukraine without us. Also, we have like really wide consensus on what to do in Ukrainian movement. We are supported by Russian movement, we are supported by Belarus movement, Polish movement, people who are around and who are affected by the situation, who really know about the situation, who go there, who go to the front line to bring water, to bring food, to bring supplies, to bring everything. They, in their opinion, are stupid and have not enough on expertise on the topic. But people who are far away and have no idea about how do we have this life there, they do. So for me, this is very strange that they are not even asking. That's kind of, I don't know, like I think it's really against all of the principles, but for some part of movement it's okay. That is very strange for me. And also like, um, yeah, I don't know. That, that's, I'm sorry, I'm a bit shocked also from the beginning of this and yeah, I still feel strange. But I mean, yes, I, I, I mean as an anarchist, we want to have a word. We don't want to be treated as just some small thing in geopolitical something. No, we exist. We fight. Other people die. That's we who are there. And we want to have a voice without interrupting sometimes. Really, like that's...
I'd like to express solidarity with Mira uh, because I also feel like ignorance of our voices from Russian perspective also because uh, when we try to say what happens for us we should very very often validate that our experience is existing that it's true that our solidarity with Ukrainian comrades are fair and this is the scene that uh, we should do actually and uh, also I have a couple of words about occupied territories by Russia uh, I think a lot of us know uh, something about uh, Donetsk and Lugansk regions, about occupied Crimea, but uh, I see very little information about what actually happened on this land, but uh, for these eight years, Donetsk and Lugansk was like um, legal nowhere when murders and kidnapping of people happen every month and a lot of people were tortured, killed, raped here and this part of this war seems like quite in invisible for lots of people and also I will say a bit later about Crimean people so I would like to ask you to be like interested in voices from there also because this is this occupied land is land of certain persons certain people who live there who love these territories and they don't want to leave it during all these years of war Uh, I just wanted to expand what Boris was saying about the information and disinformation. And I think I got an insight recently when I was interviewing uh, comrades from uh, France, Germany, Greece, Finland, uh, Poland, and like our region, uh, asking how their societies have uh, reacted to the war and how the anarchist movements reacted to the war uh, there. And I had an idea that actually um, the division between the countries that are in favor of supporting Ukrainian comrades and against them, or like kind of balancing in the middle or wanting to be neutral, I think that sometimes it depends on how much, and I'm inviting you to think about it, wherever you're coming from, how much the red like the communist, the authoritarian communist discourse is still influencing our movement because this discourse, the Russian uh, being always right, being cool and wanting to create a socialist paradise on earth and only the nationalists are against it because they don't want to be, they want to be part of the capitalist world and all these like dual power thing, NATO, Russia, com like this kind of uh, Cold War shit, is still alive. And uh, even in the countries where the movements, the communist and the anarchist movement are s divided, like they're not cooperating or like hating each other. But like, I'm just inviting you to think about how much your movement, even in this situation, is influenced by their discourse, because this is not coming from the anarchist discourse. Uh, it's not coming from there. And, uh, like, it, it, I sometimes feel like I'm reading the Emma Goldman memoirs where she was trying to tell the whole fucking world how the Russian Revolution won while being there and nobody believed her for years to come. So, I just, uh, this is just some observation that I made. Maybe it's not true, but, yeah.
Um, there's time at the end for the audience, so it would be nice also for the recording of the uh, event not to um, shout in between. Thank you. Um, one other important point we actually see in this whole discussion and which we already actually started to touch are the colonial and imperialist perspective, which are actually uh, still inside our um, movements as well, because we are coming from certain backgrounds and are socialized in certain ways of thinking. And we were discussing beforehand, like, what is this solidarity actually? And we were um, talking about it in the way that there should be actually a two-way solidarity or something like mutual solidarity, right? And that would mean that we actually interact in respect for each other and, and listen to each other and being often, yeah, for the other person's perspective. And uh, we often see that, yeah, this didn't really work out as we already um, touched right now. And we would like to get a bit deeper um, in this problematic um, uh, yeah, discussions or points. Yeah, so what I'm going to share right now is like my perception. I'm not saying it's the truth, but I think that many people might share it is that uh, for the first time probably in my life it was clear to me how anarchist solidarity is divided just like we are divided living in different countries, different countries of capitalist abundance uh, or resources, access to um, power, let's say, and also living in this uh, west, east, south, north, how much our movement copies that and how much the solidarity is divided in, along the lines of previous colonialism and also uh, capitalist abundance. Because, for example, I, I think you would agree that the difference would be very different, will be very great between a Ukrainian comrade denying solidarity to a French comrade or to a French group, and in terms of resources, in terms of power you get, in terms of solidarity, international solidarity you get and the French or the German group or German movement denies solidarity to the Ukrainian movement. I think it's clear that we are not on that side even like equal in terms of what it means when you are denying something for us or in what it means when you, we are denying something for you or even you even maybe don't even think that we exist and can deny something to you, right? So, um, and I think um, it's interesting that on the, at the, on the other hand, um, us as people from the West, like I could speak for myself again, from the East, sorry, uh, I usually looked up to the Western comrades as like the leaders of everything. They have infrastructure, they have all the knowledge. We translate your books and read how you live, how you organize. Uh, we try to copy-paste. If you come to Belarus, you would have food not bombs, uh, I don't know, free markets, like everything that you have created 10 years ago and forgot about it, we kind of try to do. But on the other hand, we in this position which is also not reflected, let's say, unreflective position, that we also see you as a point of resources. Like, we come to ask you for something, and you can tell us you, you give it or not, but it's us who are coming and wanting to tell you and wanting to explain you and wanting to, like, you to listen, to please listen, to please fucking listen, you know? So, and... This is a bit humiliating, but it's also seeing you like as a comrade. I'm not seeing somehow you as a comrade, but as a resource, which is also something we have to reflect on to kind of uh, tip the scale, because it's a, for me, it's a dual process. It's not just you who have to like, give us rights, but also us stopping to see all the other comrades as uh, unequals. You know, or like that we are a, a bit uh, inferior somehow. But the problem, I think, was that sometimes I faced with the reality after the war that it was kind of easier for 
the Western comrades uh, the, uh, to see us as victims. Like, it's, like we are doing uh, a lot of presentations about Belarus, and everybody likes it because we are living in a such a shitty country, we need help, and we are these victims, you know. But uh, whenever we start to ask, okay, can, like, can we, like, do we also have our opinion? Can we, like, say it? We also have our own analysis, not that we are copy-pasting yours anymore. We want to produce ours, how about that? And I think this is the, the way where some people, like, are not ready for that. As long as we follow your analysis, we are okay. As soon as we don't, we are barbarians. Like, we don't understand something. We are a bit stupid. We didn't read enough of Malatesta or something like that. And um, I hope it's clear that it's not like that. We all can read and we have access to the same information as you are. It's just that we live in another reality. And um, yeah, and, and the, the last point probably I will make here is also, is a little bit connected to this like political um, uh, cor correctness, right? That somehow exists kind of under, behind the curtain in the movement. So it's cool to talk about exotic people like Kurds, fighting, Zapatistas, they have some knowledge, right? They, they really are different from us and we can learn from them. But we cannot learn from Ukrainians because they're like white like us and they have to, I don't know, they have to either learn from us or just follow the general Western civilization thing. And so we're, at the, on the one hand, we are not exotic enough. On the other hand, whenever we try to be exotic, we are not like put on the same level, like we cannot compete with Kurds for the solidarity because uh, we are not even doing the same thing or like we don't understand. So I think it's, it's interesting to observe that and uh, how it's not, prob like I wouldn't imagine like if there would be a Syrian panel or like a Kurdish panel that people would attack this people just like us, but it's okay to attack us because we're white we are like European, we will um, suffer, like we will endure it. it. This is how it should go, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's an interesting observation. Um, also, I th uh, see that. Um we, as a group helping to political prisoners in Russia, militant political prisoners, we receive actually a lot of solidarity to us. And uh, for me, it's like a part of our common struggle. But uh, I see a disproportion of resources given to us and given to Ukrainian groups even now when situation is escalated and we should react and we should express solidarity and also about like colonial thinking I can't realize actually why I hear so much from anarchists about state and state and state and state, about NATO and Russia and other bullshit. Why we are not all thinking about Ukrainian people who defend themselves and who defend their land, their homes, their loved ones. For me, it's kind of very logical thing that the war uh, doesn't go in between states. It's people who defend themselves. Yeah, I think for me, one of the thoughts I had during these uh, months is like 16, 17 already soon, uh, going and talking, 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 asking all the time in the position of asking help all years before for refugees also now for war victims and for fighters I felt that yeah I mean that's 
the rules I'm, and I mean, I should really say, it, uh, the rules I'm, I'm, I make for me here is not to make comrades angry. We should be nice. We should be nice. We should be patient. Like, if we say, like, we should control every word. Because then, these people who are against us, they will catch us, use it, make statements, new articles, all these kind of things. And I think I cannot call these people comrades, really, because when you feel that much of violence and tense without really will to speak or understand, I cannot say this word, uh, like, okay, so people accept it in the movement. That's what I, how I will call it now. So even when I was uh, talking, and I'm like, land, land is the word you should not use, land is bad, bad. Then they will catch us by this land, because it already happened. And it's like, um, yeah, I mean, people have full control of, uh, on, this, uh, on their side. And I don't know how to avoid it, but for sure, like, for, for example, people are saying awful things to me during the event sometimes. But I should be nice, because making conflict can cut help to my comrades. So I don't want to be a reason of it. And it was several times, like, really brutal things people were saying. I, as a personality, if it will happen in Ukraine, <laughs> <laughs> it will have consequences. <laughs> if it happens here, I don't know how to call it. It's not racism. I, we should create some word like for this thing to Ukraine. But that, that, that exists. I feel it. I can like see it, how it's going on. And today, I have also understood the interesting thing that actually the conflict in the beginning, the, we had the person too, when he, the person was attacking me, I was patient, answering very polite. But when it was about other comrades from Ukraine, I want to fight for him. Because I cannot see that. Yeah, that's interesting. Just sorry for insights. And it's also that, for example, there are even cases when people make really damage to our movement because uh, Nazis, they are trying to see... They are trying to say, look, these communists, these leftists, they support Russia, they want our death of a movement in Ukraine. It, it has influenced what is published here, what is going on here. But we cannot criticize because we should be nice. And, like, for example, it was this, uh, some Italian graffiti person who made graffiti in uh, Mariupol, occupied. I have friends who walked from there to survive, really, who did drink water from snow to survive there, and it was luck they had this fucking snow. Mariupol is a very sensitive topic, so the Italian comrade come there, make graffiti with some girl crying, like the Donbass girl crying with these tears, whatever, and put this anti-fascist action symbol on that. Do you understand that I cannot use the, the anti-fascist symbol after that in Ukraine normally? Because it would be a, this association that these are the people who are doing propaganda for Russia. I don't know how to explain it, but it, it, it also has, like, we are fighting to see, to say, okay, we are doing this and that, we are good, we are nice, we are anarchists, join us, trying to make the movement, and then it's done. And the person do it and have no consequences uh, after that. I mean, it's still people accepted to the movement. That's really... So I think that, yeah, I mean, I, I want this part also to be in the consideration that we are not only supporting people, we are also trying to build up movement and all this aggression is visible and I mean, yeah, actually I don't know, like I feel much more secure under bombs in Kiev than here. Okay, thank you. Um, we would like to touch another point which we kind of framed in the sense of critical solidarity. Because all the thoughts which were brought right now, and we already feel it in the room, that there are people who don't share or have different perspectives. We were really wondering, like, um, a lot of people support a lot of crazy things in this world, but as Mira just said, you have to perform in a certain way to get solidarity right now. 
And we were wondering why, um, yeah, it's so so easy for um, people to withdraw solidarity, but it has such huge consequences right now for people in Ukraine. And people don't care about that. They don't consider this. We were listening to the question of resources, who has the resources right now in the movement and who needs it. And um, so, yeah, um, we would uh, exchange a few thoughts um, on that matter or go a bit deeper into that question all right um so one of the things that we are actually talking about during our presentations as abc belarus is war in ukraine and we can't shut up about this because it's a huge topic that actually affects us all politically socially economically um and it it, it doesn't matter that there are like no bombs currently falling in Belarus, and it might happen tomorrow. Belarus is affected by that war. But when we thought about talking about this topic, right, it came to our mind that actually we will get punished for talking about the war in Ukraine. We will get negative reviews for solidarity that we are calling from the comrades, right? And we actually got to learn how easy it is for the people to disregard what we are saying just because we are talking about the war in Ukraine. Maybe our position on the war in Ukraine do not align. Maybe you know something we don't know and you are a very intelligent and knowledgeable person. I don't know. But it is shocking and it is very disturbing how easy it is, how it easy it was, is, and during those following weeks and months and years to follow, how it easy it is for anarchists to abandon their comrades, abandon their comrades who are fighting, abandon their comrades who are um, fighting in, on, the, on the streets, who are fighting in the prisons, um, in Belarus, I'm not talking about Ukraine, in Belarus, uh, because of what we are saying. For you, our comrades in prisons are becoming enemies, stronger, not for you, but for some of you in, in the zone, are becoming bigger enemies, from my feeling, than the state, capital, and all the horrors that are, in, like all the horrible uh, systems that are destroying human beings. It is very hard to go through this years of solidarity work to see how fragile it is, how fragile are those connections that we were building through the years of our struggle, how easy it is for people to break those connections, sitting in comfort of your houses, of your corner of your planet, uh, without any consequences for you, but with huge consequences, not only for us, but for the comrades that are fighting in prisons. And I would like you to, to, to think, to let it fucking sink, that you are ready to abandon people who gave their freedoms, and some of them gave their lives, uh, in favor of your political contradictions with the other groups. It is, it is astonishing, it is horrible, it is very dis, um, disencouraging for any solidarity work to come. And you have to know that this is a huge danger that is actually not above only ABC Belarus or Kiev groups, but any group that is doing solidarity work, that um, comrades are becoming enemies so fast, not only for those who are, fi who are like us, right? But also those who are sitting in prisons and they are continuing their fight there. Uh, and also about our comrades in prisons. For me, as a person who doing solidarity work and uh, supporting prisoners in Russian prisons, I can't imagine uh, that all that people, our comrades, our friends, would be free if Russian state, Russia's regime will stay. And also, it's impossible to imagine uh, that, for example, repressed Crimean Tatars got free. Maybe it would be necessary to say that uh, this group of people, this group of native people of Crimea, 
repressed by Russian regime since occupation of Crimea and uh, got huge prison terms, like 10 years in prison, 20 years in prison, up to life sentence. Just because they, for a very long time, opposed any authority and they were quite independent from any state. And also these people who are having sentences on terrorist, so-called terrorist articles for just being a part of community. They also wouldn't be free, even if regime will somehow change it. I don't know uh, what is magic should happen to, <laughs> to lead to this result, but uh, for me it's like, very clear that freedom of our comrades of hundreds of prisoners in Russian prisons is directly connected with the fall of this regime, this state, and uh, this country in its current, current state. I'm also thinking that it seems that movements here are fighting for this and that rights. For us, the biggest thing oppressing us is uh, attacking Russia. So why people think that it should be justice for them, they are fighting for justice, and for us it should be only peace. Because justice for me is my friends in Russian and Belarus jails getting out. Justice for me is stolen kids going back to their families, because Russia also stole kids from occupied territories. Justice for me is we are not sleeping with bombs every night, like really, because they do it every night, like they can do it months with just one, two nights without. Justice for me is also our comrades who are war prisoners to be back from these jails. And justice for me also to have um, peace, really, but peace when they go away, apologize, or I know how long they should apologize what, what they did, but whatever, go away, and we have place there to really think Greece for who we lost. Because just stopping it on the point where it is, it's not justice, totally. And for me it's also interesting that it's one more time when this fight is not our fight. I also listened to these arguments during Maidan, it's not our fight, it's not good for anarchists, this and that, and I'm really curious which ideal revolution with ideal anarchists in Bakum people are waiting here? Okay, we already made quite a lot of points. We will have a last final, like a last round with a final statements of each of you. For now, uh, supporting of our friends, our comrades, groups in Ukraine means to be consistent. For me, it fits on feminist logic, on decolonial logic, anti-imperialistic logic, and from my perspective, to be a feminist means to have a right to self-defense, to fight back. This is exactly what Ukrainian people, Ukrainian Solidarity Group, do right now. They realizing they right to self defense. Mm, I just wanted to share uh, one last example that is connected with uh, what I think is many times when we make the declarations about who we are as anarchists, like we are anti-capitalist, we are anti-sexist, we are anti-homophobic, we are anti-militarist. And it's becoming empty words when we are actually not building any structures that support these statements in our movement. Because it's easy to say I'm anti-sexist, but when the person claims that they have been harassed, to just tell them to fuck off or like to say, don't say about it, we are anti-sexist. So sexism doesn't exist here and it's not in the anarchism base. So stop talking about it, right? 
And I think that anti-militarism is becoming kind of such a thing, which is just declarative, solidarity with the people, without the, any practical consequences, how I see it. It shouldn't be solidarity with solidarity collectives. But I don't see how the people who claim to be anti-militarist in the anarchist movement and claiming solidarity with the people or the working class, how they actually do it and what is growing out of it. And about this purity, just on the example of this camp, I don't know how much you are involved in talking with the organizers or how much you're following this Telegram chat, which is telling every day about people fucking up this, people fucking up that, there is a police going to come, or a fire brigade cannot access, or the train uh, railways got fucked up. For us, it's just messages that we read to enjoy our commonality here. But behind that curtain, there sits, I don't know how many people, and receiving the fucking calls from the cops, from the fire brigade, from the state, from the city, and they're talking to them for us to be here. And if we were so purist here, anti-state, anti-police, no talk, no dialogue, no conversation, we, like this, so we needed someone to take care of these conversations for us to be here. Why is it so unclear for some people that we cannot be purist in everything we do? And why is it not clear that for us to sit here and not be bombed and not be advanced by the fascist state, somebody needs right now to fight on the fucking borders of the East and West. And yeah, we can disregard these people and say they're bullshit, but this is how we can live. So yeah, for me, it's like very clearly connected that purism doesn't exist. We are not stupid to say that participation of anarchists in the army is a delusion from the idealist anarchist picture. But we are offering that solidarity because we understand there is much more to that picture than black and white. Two days ago, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering the two days ago a lot, so just let, let it sink in you. Uh, two days ago at our talk, there was uh, a guy or a person who said it's a strange world. And it kind of like got stuck in my head. His strange world was because uh, the, the, it's strange that people are fighting in the military against Russia. Um, and I think for me, it became a thing that is like, you know, rotating in your head and it's getting stuck and stuck and stuck and again and you think, fuck, it's a strange world. So I would like to talk about shortly the strange world, right? Um, it's a strange world where anarchists tell fighting people to lay down their weapons. Very strange for me. It's a strange world in which so-called anarchists rally to abandon solidarity with those who fight for their homes. It's a strange world in which it is more important to provoke comrades from war regions than actually show a little bit of solidarity. It is a strange world in which capitalist peace for anarchists is more important than a fight against dictatorship. It is a strange world in which anarchists are expected to be nice. It is a strange world in which anarchists are laughing during a minute of solidarity with tortured and murdered by the state. <laughs> One last thing. I think all knows what Fortress Europe is, right? It is a horrible monster that exists beyond the states. It extends to the eastern borders, to the southern borders, sometimes to the northern borders. It is a place where you live. It is the place where we have to live right now. 
It is a place where you live in peace, you enjoy that peace, you fight against the state, you fight against the capitalism, but you have to understand that every time you tell the people that they have to run to Fortress Europe, maybe they don't want. And in the last years, you might have seen that a lot of people prefer to stay in war, in the war zones where the torture and death and starvation and hunger and diseases are there and it's better for them to come here. This is their home, right? You might think. But ask yourself, why people around the world, in the war, in the struggle, don't want to come here to your beautiful, nice place with the blue skies, mountains, green meadows, and things like that? It is important for, me, for you to understand that we don't want to live in Fortress Europe. Your fortress in Europe with a fake peace, with the fake enjoy of life, with the fake fucking high salaries, we don't want to see that. As anarchists, as anarchists, we don't want to have fortress Europe. We don't want to have this nice place where people would enjoy some peace while the rest of the world is burning. As anarchists, we have to be in the places where the world is burning. As anarchists, we have to be with our comrades on the streets, in the trenches, in the prisons, or outside of them. We have to show as much solidarity as we can, because solidarity is what makes us all strong. And as soon as we stick together, we can make the revolution possible. I want to say that, yeah, uh, actually, we, when, when everything was like going on since 2014, we as anti-militarists were signing all these uh, statements, blah, 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 because we saw that it's still possibility for peace and wished it just to stop. We did it already. It's not that we didn't try. We were fighting for stopping militarization. It was, if you check all texts, it would be my sign there. Sure, I think not. <laughs> okay, a lot, a lot really. Uh, most of the people who signed that papers, they're in fights now. One, my friend who signed that uh, things is uh, in jail as a war prisoner now. So we are not really, we, it's not that we didn't try. It was just the moment when we understood that the problem is that Russia is taking territories and then they make people against this people will to go to their army and fight next territories. That's what I call militarization, really. And we are anti-militarists. Our anti-militarist people decided to join army too, to stop it. That's how we see it. I mean, you can disagree, but a lot of people see situation like this, just want to mention. And yeah, I mean, it's not any professional army, it's civilians who went to fight and who hope to be civilians after. It's not the people who are building Korea in the army who we have, yeah. And also I want to say about solidarity is that actually solidarity is not only what Europe given to us or we, like, I mean, not only this, we have a lot of solidarity in, in Ukraine now. It's uh, that mostly donations are coming from people from Ukraine because a lot of people having like really small income still donate. It's that when we lose somebody, when I, we had, I had lost, like recently, the first thing I want is very fast to go to my comrades there because they are the ones who understand and who will support. Even when we are making mistake, mistakes, we became like really softer to each other. We are not judging that easy. We are trying to understand each other. It's a pity that sometimes to become more anarchist, to feel more solidarity, to try to talk to people more, to feel more that you are part of your community, you need war. That's awful, but that's true. It changes a lot of things. And also, like uh, Boris said, that, yeah, I mean, why people don't want to live in Europe? Like, for me, actually, before that happened, maybe I would like to live in several places, 
if it's somewhere is nice, I, know, I cannot say that I don't want, not forever, but for a year or two, it would be nice. But when it happened, it was fake news somewhere that Germany is giving passports to Ukrainians. That was the moment when I was like, fucking hell, go fucking away this passport, I don't need it. Because when it's something like this happens, the only thing you want, and then the only thing you think about is security of your people, if that they will be alive. And yeah, I mean, yeah, nothing less interesting than German passport intention, really. <laughs> like, <laughs> nobody was curious even. That was fun, I think. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. It would be nice if people would think about solidarity and about just relations also between each other, not only based on some like unshakable principles, but also based on just being human, being part of community, being part of the movement. Yeah, the way people talking. I mean, it's not only critic, it's also how people do it, like really. Because I mean, yes, maybe we are overreacting, People from Ukraine, I, I would agree. I, I'm, I'm definitely overreacting when somebody is shouting, when somebody is trying to put something against us, because it's a very sensitive topic now. If it would be, I'm also a feminist, and I think that it would be, if it would be like some things against feminism people doing, people will support me and understand why I'm so overreacting. But with this, we have war. We all have already people who died. Some of us very close people who died. And yes, Making it, I mean, we are not going to any events when we, where we can traumatize because we understand that, okay, this and this, we should not go there because it would be very traumatic, but people still want to bring it to us. And nobody see that it is violence. Okay, um, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for all of you sharing. I know it's hard, you just mentioned it. It's, it's really hard, it's, uh, especially in an environment where you know there are people really offensive and rejective. And um, yeah, I, I think the, the important point is that this is your life reality. This is not an abstract theoretical discussion some people can choose to take. This is your life. And I think people should be a bit more respectful and I would announce that for the coming discussion to be constructive and respectful and take into account what was, what was actually said the last one and a half hour. So we will give over to the moderation for the discussion now. Hello, so I'm part of the organization and I'm the one who's going to make the moderation of this discussion in this room. So the subject of this uh, workshop is, it was to hear the point of view from uh, the perspective of the people fighting against Russia, so Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. Listen to the point of view and trying to understand and understand why they are doing what they're doing and also why are they saying what they are saying. It's important to respect the subject of this worship and that everybody who's going to speak should try to respect. Change the subject, it is a form of censure and we are trying to avoid that. So, for example, so if I was doing a feminist workshop, some, but some people would try to ask questions about the patriarchy and the existence of patriarchy. I would be like, uh, I can't talk, you know, I'm trying to talk about feminism. So, I would be, of course, there would be a point where in the workshop I would say, please do not disturb and please shut up. So, this is why to keep on the subject it's going to be able to liberty of expression. So there was a few workshops to talk about anti-militarism and they're still going on. So if the theory question about anti-military, uh, if do we have to support people that are trying to fight against a war, it's not the topic of the subject. So please 
we're going to try to let those people talk. So when I'm going to do the moderation, we're going to try to respect the subject. And, and if some people don't want to try to respect the subject, I will try to make them not speak. So now we're going to make a tour of moderation. So this person, Milo, is going to bring the microphone to each person. And so I'm going to try not to do an arbitrary way, but to, to have a, like a, to, to make a rank. So first we're going to make, give the... So there's going to be each person can speak one time, so ask a question. But if, no, if there's no new person asking something, we're just going to give... A, someone who already spoke we're gonna let the microphone to this person okay so if you ask a question or if you speak uh, could you try to synthesize your subject and try to think before talking uh, is it a repetition or am I bringing something new and please instead of applauding applauding which could interact into the comprehension of the workshop, you can just do this signs. Thank you. And everybody will be, would say, okay. And if you're not okay, you have to put your hands down. So this won't block the fluidity of the conversation. Please, if someone <laughs> shouts, do not shout. And I'm trying to ask you to respect the people who are on the scene and as you can see the subject are very sensitive and and think about it instead of criticizing so i'm going to try to do this moderation and if i can't we would just stop the event now it's your turn so i just wanted to express my sadness and one thing i'm sad about is that we couldn't focus on the actual topic proposed for this conversation uh, but I understand this because uh, the second thing I'm sad about is that many of our comrades, and not only in, in Europe, seem to treat solidarity as a kind of a supermarket when I go and I pick some products and I put them back on the shelf saying, no, this is not exactly what I like, this has wrong ingredients or this, this has not enough calories or whatever. Um, and it's been said already by one comrade uh, earlier in this camp, that here we are supposed to celebrate the spirit of uh, Mikhail Bakunin. And I don't think he would go to a supermarket market of solidarity. Instead, he would go and uh, try to support um, national liberation movements and uh, national uprising and make them more into revolutions and teach people anarchy. That's what I wanted to say, I think. But uh, I also have a question. Could, could you tell a bit about um, international legions and what they are? How, how, does it, how do they work? Um, I see it's really hard in this very heated atmosphere to talk about what's really your original work going on in Ukraine. And that's something that I would be really interested in. I would be very happy to hear a bit about how anti-authoritarianism can be practiced in such a difficult environment and how you, like maybe just like a practical example of everyday act activity, activism in this very difficult context of how you practice anti-authoritarianism there. Uh, to the question of uh, like practically what we do inside Ukraine, because this one is about solidarity. We have at 8 o'clock, we don't know where, do we? We are sure. A nice arena at 8 o'clock, we will have uh, the presentation fr from the co like solidarity collectives, who is the collective who worked toward this helping people, like solidarity for Ukraine inside Ukraine. So it would be me and uh, the comrade who lives in Ukraine, we will tell about our experience during this, uh, yeah, during this. So if, if you are ready to come, we will be happy to see you there. And it was the question about international legions, as I understood. Um, we are not working with them. From people who have been there, I, ha I heard not very nice uh, comments on the people who are inside. 
it's just some foreigners who came to fight. They are definitely just strangers. Um, and I would say that um, for Ukraine, it was a big topic in the beginning. They made it like really everywhere. But in the end, it didn't over with any like big something during this month. Uh, it is that some uh, units are part of this inter uh, legion, but yeah, I think that visible ones are only like Belarus uh, units and Russian units, which are very different. I mean, it's each of them is a different topic to discuss. So international legion, as if you imagine it as one group of people going somewhere, like no, it's not. It's just bureaucratic thing for people who fight in different uh, groups and who are foreigners. Is it clear enough? Because I don't know from whom was the question. At first, let me say I'm really ashamed of my German background because these voices who are yelling like, oh, they're, they're um, in Ukraine, they should not practice these or that. I think it's really ignorant. So, yes, that was my first point. And um, I also feel ashamed for, like, we have so much resources, as you told, but we didn't use it um, in a really productive way, I think. And uh, this would that this is one of my main points here, like to take it fucking serious. If you call us anarchists, if you call us activists, otherwise it's only just a nice patch on your back or something. Yeah, and second complex, right today, um, there was a meeting of anti-militarist coordination and I visited it to hear what they, yeah, what they gonna, gonna talk and not everybody was a fool, but the same guys out of there were coming here to provoke this meeting. I fucking hate it because it was exactly as you were describing it. Like they were saying, yeah, we are against the war. We have to stop everybody with a gun in his hands, but don't even think about, for example, that you already had these thoughts. And I just want to give I think three examples how you could act as a like an uh, like an anti-militarist activist in a solidaric way. So you can, for example, you can organize general strike like in the weapon industry, but it would be sinful like in Iran because Iran is selling weapons to Russia. But if you organize this in Ukraine right now, the consequence will be invasion of Russia. Fucked up. So. Second example would be just support the fucking anarcho-communist combat organization which is actually attacking Russian military infrastructure right now. So why you're talking about like, oh, we want peace, blah, blah, blah. Just go there, raise money and yeah, support the anti-militarist activists in Russia. Um, for example, maybe if you don't, if you're against weapons, maybe then so you can send some vests which can protect you from shooting. So it would be more than just l like, no, no, you can't go to the front line, then you're not anarchist. Know what I mean? So, and last one is a question. I am really interested in how, or, or if you, if you thought about networking with like anarchist struggles um, in Iran and Sudan and so on, or are you connected in any way? Because as my point of view, maybe this is like a kind of a starting cell or something to a global self-defense unit or something um, against all states, against all invasions, against militarism and for the freedom of every human being. Thanks. You. Thank you. Uh, maybe just shortly about uh, comrades in Iran and Sudan. Um, we are in touch with comrades from Sudan. Um, unfortunately, the situation is really fucked up for them and there are not so many. And um, the only thing we could recently do was providing money. And uh, so, yeah, it's kind of... But we try to network. <laughs> um, and But what I also wanted to say that unfortunately right now at the same time there's an event 
about grassroots movement, about uh, Sudan and Iran. So yeah, it's <laughs> pretty. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, as if it was a question to Ukraine, we don't have contacts. We are interested in because they have something similar. But I would say that we are also a small movement. We are not big. And resources to really follow are not very high. I think attention is more to Kurdistan. We have more like uh, of understanding also because we had people who went there and then they made uh, speeches and yeah, we had a comrade from Russia who was going everywhere and he also made uh, this um, like website and it's uh, people translating things about Kurdistan. So it's more for a pity he fall in the battle recently. So. But I know that people keep on this uh, work, and if you go to Belarus uh, table there, they also have books translated into Russian about Kurdistan. So if you speak Russian, you can buy it. Yeah, with uh, Sudan and Iran, I think it would be interesting, but it's not only us, it's also they never tried to contact, so we should find some resources to, on both sides at some point when it would be possible. I mean, it would be cool if it uh, can happen, yeah, but not yet. Um, I won't talk about Iran, Sudan, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to clarify something that is very important for me and I think important for people in this table. Um, who thinks in this room, after this talk and maybe after previous interactions with us, that we are for war? Just, just raise your fucking hands, just, just to make it clear. Right? There, we are for war. We are here, like, let's make some war, people. Who are in audience thinks that people on this table love wars and want to have more wars. Because I've heard some comments about that coming from that corner. And apparently you're not listening. It is very important for us to clarify that people who are sitting on this table oppose all wars. There is no good war. But sometimes we find ourselves in wars. And that's what, where we are right now. And instead of being individualistic, very self-focused people who are saying, just run, alone. You can make this decision, run. We are trying to do something collectively. We are trying to fight collectively, and this is our point. Not, not fighting like war, 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 every, every war, but fighting this war in the way we can, in the way, we, like, in the way our energy allows, and I think it's important to respect that and to hear that finally, that there are no militarists here, there are no people who are supporting wars, and this is a very important point to make for me here. Uh, hi, I will try to speak in English, and also I can do it in French, okay. So firstly, I just wanted to say thank you very much to the five of you um, for coming. I think it's a very brave thing, um, the comrades who fight in all different ways. And I think it's very brave of all of you to come here, especially when there are comrades in the room who want to tell you that what you're doing is wrong and who want to spit on the graves of, of all of our dead. I think that's incredibly brave. And I think it's as brave as taking up the gun. So I think thank you very much and a round of applause for the, for the table. Um, for those of you in the room who are, are coming here to disrupt these talks, and especially the last person who wants to laugh in a minute of silence, je dis nique ta mort. Parce que en fait, uh, non. Oh, sorry. So, fuck your mother. Uh, I, say, I say, fuck your dead. If you want to come and you think that anti militarism is funny and to laugh on the graves of our dead, then fuck your dead too. And your grandparents in Italy, your grandparents in France, were they fighting with the Nazis? Or were they fighting against them? You ask me, in, in Italy you have this legacy, right? Where you say, uh, Brigada, we're against the fascism. So where is against the fascism now? And on top of that, I want to say that it's very easy to come here and to attack anarchists as anti-militarism. But there's a fucking police station down the road where they have guns. There's a military base about 10 kilometers away. If you're a real anti-militarist, I'm with you. We take some Molotov and we go to the fucking base here. Because this is the power, right?
And, and the last thing I want to say is about colonialism. I think that in, in Europe we have a, one view of colonialism that is Europe and America as a colonial power, right? But to the east of us there is also this other colonial power, Russia, right? And historically in Belarus, in Kazakhstan, in Ukraine, in many countries around the area, this has been a huge imperialist power. So if we stand against imperialism, it's not just American imperialism that we have to stand against, but also Russian imperialism. And so my question to those people who, are, who say they're anti-militarism, where is your anti-imperialist perspective? Um, and lastly, a, a little question to the, to the guys, um, all of you on the table. I just wondered, um, in, terms of, in terms of prisoner support, what is the most useful thing that can be done aside from money right now? Uh, yes. Thank you again. Um, well, right now, I don't think any solidarity action next to the embassy makes a lot of sense or like will really release or there is a, any leverage on uh, on the powers in uh, Russia or Belarus to that we can like push uh, but I think that uh, it's important and we uh, have also started to think about it what are we going to do with all these people who will get out of jails who have been in jails repeatedly but also for, with the people who have been in the front line and having all the mental uh, disturbances that people from prison have and we as a movement are never ready to actually accept and leave uh, with the people who are like this is my own experience that it's really hard to um, to live with a comrade after they experience something as hard as prison in Belarus but I, I can only imagine what it is like to experience something at war and I think we need to prepare for that and prepare some uh, structures that could help us to really socialize these people in our way to show their co 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 collective solidarity for them to to have actually a place to stay not for like one week in a squad but if they need their time there should be some structures some like sanatorium like say I don't know massage um, sessions whatever talking to them uh, listening to their experiences and and like I don't know therapy groups uh, organized by comrades, and I think this is not at all present, uh, at least not that I know of it. So I think we should, not only for Belarusian and Russian prisoners, like we, we have a fucking loads of prisoners uh, everywhere, in Italy, in like in Spain, in Chile, whatever, like, and we need to take care of the comrades and not pretend that the day they come back to, to, to their release, they are the same as us mentally or like on, on this level. So for me, it's really important. I mean, I'm saying it each presentation to see our comrades, not in 20 years back, we need the collapse of Putinist regime. So it's very connected things. And for war prisoners, because we have this kind, we don't have uh, comrades uh, from Ukraine who are in jail in Ukraine in the moment. Like, and we didn't have last uh, 12 years. Like, it's not very common to be in jail there because of corruption. And because, you know, like, we just have not, not really this kind of, re of regime. I mean, it's not better, it's just not uh, this uh, way uh, violent. But uh, also, I mean, with the helping from here, I think that if these war prisoners will be out, I will definitely not risk uh, them to recommend to go here because then they will have this re traumatization really because then they can meet people who are aggressive to them. The same we have here like people who usually this anti, so-called anti-militaries, they love desert here and we have some, but it's people with whom you find there like really. And people who are pressured to say it's un like I, I mean I listened just two days ago for the stories that they are pressured to say that it's because they are very pacifist, but it's not not this. I'm here and not in army, not because I'm very pacifist. It's just because I'm afraid to die in a battle. I'm just not brave enough. Like 
that's the thing. <laughs> so for me, for this, yeah, nothing. And yeah, for repeating, just money. I think um, for me both, for prisoners and for the war that is going on, the wars that are going on, you are living in the, again, in the, in the fucking capital of capitalism, right? And that means that a lot of things that are happening here are affecting other regions. So to give an example, IKEA shopping, right? Wood comes from Belarus. Your fucking chairs most probably made in Belarusian prisons. It's, that's, that's how it works, right? You are very opposing, uh, you know, delivery of weapons to Ukraine, uh, many of you. But somehow there's very little from the anarchist movement shouts about stopping the military-industrial complex that delivers stuff to Russia. Look at that. Think about how can you disrupt Russian capital in, in your country. You are in Switzerland. This is a fucking, I don't know, capital of capital of capitalism. There is so much Russian capital that you can become very rich if you figure out how to get it. Um, so do something. Like, don't fucking waste your energy on a couple of tanks that sent to Ukraine. Do things that actually affect the other parts of the world. Yes, it will take a little bit more effort than coming to a presentation and shit-talking about your dead comrades. It is complicated. It, it requires fucking effort. So do those efforts in the same way as those people who are fighting, actually putting a lot of effort in the fight. <laughs> uh, he would like to do something, to say something in German. So... <laughs> Okay, thank you. So I would like to say something about the Putin propag propaganda. So in in the situation of uh, Ukraine, so it's uh, yeah the link between the Putin propaganda and the war. So a, a lot of uh, things have have been said. So uh, been published uh, to the link like in German, so also uh, from, from Stalin, uh, in the St Stalin uh, movement, uh, but it's come a lot, of, a lot of stuff, propaganda is going to the right. For example, in Germany, uh, there is uh, the F FAD, AFD, which is, so against the, the military stuff that comes to Ukraine. So all the, so there's the left and the right, the right side that is, that is a bit uh, together. And I would just like to know w w what is the newspaper published about that. So there was a conference about uh, the ne neurofascism. Uh, and they they in, they invited a representative of uh, so it was in 2013, and uh, and there was uh, an, an anti-fascist uh, protest. So the right parties get money from from the from from the Russia. So how come the right wing always uh, gets propaganda from Putin? So he's saying that there's this story about that um, the Kiev regime is a Putinist uh, marionette regime, but they were um, actually the president is a Jewish comedian. And how do you see the actual situation in Ukraine at the moment um, concerning human rights? And how can the movement develop? What is there to defend? I mean, war destroys a lot of things, and for sure, like. Uh, the human rights, really. Like, I, I mean, it's also that people who usually fight on protests, they are mostly now in army or busy with volunteership. So I would say that for sure state go goes mad. They do a lot of things. They plan to do years, and now they have space for that, especially um, in the field of labor law. It's really, like, disgusting what they do. And human rights, I don't know, like our, like our best uh, person for human rights who actually supported us with all our prisoners as ABC since we started to work is uh, in war, like war prisoner now in uh, Lugansk. Like Maxim Budkevich, which we also make campaign about. 
who is actually a well-known anti-militarist in Ukraine and journalist and was given speech uh, like um, lessons against uh, the language of hate and this hate speech, like, like how, to, how to do it like correct way and all these nice things. And now he is blamed being a Nazi, making war crimes and in Russian jail. Like, in this Lugansk jail, but in jail by Russia. So for sure, like we suffer without him. It's really that half of work is impossible to do. And in general, there are no people, like they are destroying all the situation. I mean, economically, human rights meaning, all the meanings. For sure, when it is war, everything is not working as it should be, not only on the front line, but it's also that uh, important people, they are dying and they are in jail and they are in fight. So for the moment, there are a lot of difficult situations in these fields. And I would say for sure that it was better before uh, 24 February 22. For a pity, like, yeah, that's like this. Uh, je vais parler en français. Les personnes intervenantes sont très fatiguées. So um, now I'm going to talk in French. So we're going to finish at, seven, at half past five because everybody is really tired. So who has a question? There's no question that we are solidary with the fight you are fighting in a specific way. And another point, we have to say, we have to talk about this. For this, we need a kind of um, common ground understanding. I just wanted to hang up a pl um, poster, and I was attacked because of that. I'm transgender, queer, etc. And it's good if you're being respectful concerning this, and if we, among each other, accept our differences and that we have different opinions. I don't want to say more about that now. Your position is very important and we want to hear it. We want to hear it from Belarus, we want to hear it from everyone from Russia, we want to hear it from Ukraine, we want to hear it from other countries as well, from other countries on the world. We are solidarity with all people who are in the prisons. That's not in question. Our main problem is of a lot of people, not a lot of those are here. The person who said that we were coming to um, disturb was not telling the truth. We want to demilitarize anarchism. So there's a discussion about being gender inclusive. Maybe I'm not uh, talking in a good way, but please let, just let me finish. For us, it's important to distinguish between uh, self-defense, social revolution, and militarization and war. And for us, it's important to think about how can we not become part of a militarization and still fight and be solidarity with the people who are coming into prison or prison of becoming prisoners of war. So it means we have to um, think about how can we get Russian deserters, Ukrainian deserters out of the countries and get a become to a politic that disempowers the power and in this this context we think that using weapons is legitimate but taking up uniforms state organizations fascistic group or military we don't think that's legitimate I, th I see that I have to come to the end and it would be good if we could find a respectful frame to talk about these differences with all to the respect that you've been saying to uh, concerning Ukraine, Belarus and Russia because we have to, but we still want to bring our position to the table because it's important to us. Yeah, um, thank you for question. It's actually second time after the year, the same question from the same person, interesting. Um, last time I asked what are actually the ways to deal with other way and we didn't find common ground on how to delete another way then but I have a proposal for people who really uh, feel that all about militarism and they very well know how to do it other way we have we have all the resources and the possibilities to provide 
coming to Ukraine for them. You don't need visa. It's very easy. You just take in your passport. You are coming to Ukraine. We will provide place to stay. I mean, we can do it really. I'm not joking. If you are interested, we can do it. You can help physically with humanitarian parts. So bringing water to people, bringing food to people on the front line, like close to the front, to civilians, not to fighting ones. It's, I mean, it's still front line, but easier. And maybe then... We, you can talk to our soldiers and you maybe will find common ground there when you share what they have in reality, then in that position your voice would be like really strong. So maybe that's the good plan, that's the, just the proposal if people want. Because for me, discussing it in a circle, 16 months, is quite tiring. I have my own interests which never rise up. For example, I was always questioning how what happened in Germany in the 40s could happen, with all the evil happen. And now I'm questioning how it could happen second time, how society can support mass murder in general. So, yeah, I have other interests, and I think we should also concentrate on many other topics around the world, around Russia, because I think it needs a lot of research and a lot of thinking what happened to the society, why it is like this. I'm very interested, not aggressively at all, because I have members of my family who also that direction, and I, for sure I want to think about that, how to change their opinion, how to work against this propaganda there and not in Europe, you know? And it's really like... Uh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, you can also go to Russia. There is a lot of work to do in Russia. And, I mean, yes, you need visa. Visa is very hard to do for the people living in, in Western Europe. It's very hard. You just have to go to the embassy and pay 35 euro. But, like, get your shit going. Like, start doing things. You can't do it here. Do somewhere else. Go to Ukraine. Go to Belarus. In Belarus, you also don't need visa. Belarus is a very socialist country. Go Belarus. In, in, enjoy Minsk. Very nice city. I'm not, I'm not joking. We, we, we really need people in all those countries to continue our fight because people are sitting in prison, because people are fleeing the prosecution. You can help. You can help in so many different ways, but like disrupting solidarity, what is happening quite often. So come and, and do work. Show your solidarity through action. Uh, I just wanted to address the um, thesis uh, or the message about seeing uh, some of the methods that other anarchists are using as counter-revolutionary or like destructive for the movement, right? So, for example, speaking for myself, like I identify as an anarcho-communist and like I really honestly think that many individualist tendencies are counter-revolutionary and like really destructive for the movement. For, at least for the work I am doing and for the methods I am choosing to do it, they are sometimes like in a real con confrontation with uh, what my message, what, I, what message I want to deliver to the people and how they see the people or like generally the population. But I never, it never occurred to me that I could like come and impose something on them, just like I'm not letting anybody impose anything on me like as the, that other, other anarchists would like discipline me into something. So I think it's really been 16 months and it, you just need to acknowledge this as a fact that there are some anarchists in the world, in Ukraine, in this room, that are okay with using, using this method in this situation. And you just accept it. And instead of disrupting this, if you think it's counter-revolutionary, make your own events, do it, understand how you want to figure it out, and not like ask us how we should figure it out for you, uh, to, to figure out your trend of anarchism. I just had to say, it will be the last question, because the comrades are tired. And yeah, we'll finish after this. Sorry. Uh, I just want to say thank you for speaking. Uh, I just want to make a quick point of question. Like, I feel like anarchist take it's, um, taking arms is not new. Like an anarchist history, like this. Um, 
Yes, Spanish anarchists took up arms to defend against Franco's fascist army's insurgency, and now contemporary Ukrainian anarchists are taking up arms to defend themselves from occupation. And I feel like a lot of people are neglecting that when Russian army occupies parts of Ukraine, people are disappeared, people are taken to torture centers, so like, yeah. So like, it's, yeah, I'm just, my question is why do you think Western anarchists are not look, like reflecting on this history and acting so surprised that people are taking arms, even forgetting the Makhno Pshina, the Makhno army taking arms to defend their freedom? And I guess my second question is, are there like any non-Western um, examples of um, support, like support that, would, that you value that was beyond Europe or in the global south that was different from the way um, North American or European anarchists were kind of like undermining solidarity? Did you find better solidarity from the global south or non-European Anglo context? Yeah, thank you. I see... Uh important for me difference between uh, stopping and ending the war. Uh, and uh, the most common thing I see here in the streets, like stop the war or stop the different wars. And also the same I saw in Russia. And uh, I would like to end this war. <laughs> so uh, just a quick answer about the, why um, the Western anarchist forgot uh, or like don't think or don't uh, use the example of the Spanish or Makhnovshina. Because it's a, two different things. It's like one thing is when you self-organize and you fight with like your comrades, not as part of the state army, and you're fighting for the revolution with like anti-revolutionary forces, which was the case in Makhno army and the Spanish war, which is not the case right now in Ukraine. But at the same time, uh, I think when the people with a clear anti-militarist position uh, trying to produce the message that the anarchism or all anarchists have always believed this way, that we should never step into the army uh, if it's, unless, it's not the, unless it's the anarchist army, which is not true. And if you read the historical figures, I don't know, like read Kropotkin versus Malatesta, read that and that, so there, was, there would be always arguments in or in, against joining this or that force based on how you see the consequences of joining or not joining. And so, for example, I think most of us here are like basically supporting the position that the consequences of anarchists retreating from this ground is basically means that there will be no anarchist movement afterwards, neither in Russia, nor in Ukraine, nor in Belarus. And we would like to have that even if we are ending up in another liberal state, and we will, because we don't if believe in a one-time revolution that happens in a day, but we are like ready to fight for this, the state that is now like more liberal than the, the other fascist states, because this is where we survive. This is where we can live and not die and rot in fucking prisons. So this is why we're choosing that. This is a temporary solution and we understand that we're not stupid but this we see as the most uh, right thing to do right now and we like call in the rest to even if you don't support just listen to the comrades who are there why is it so differ difficult second question I I will answer a second question and this is it. Uh, for the second question about solidarity in other parts of the world, I think that's a bit like what we discussed, that everything is, for us, it was first everything concentrated on Moscow, then we stopped being that much, and then it's everything concentrated on Berlin or something west. And it's like... We actually, I was running this with the group, with my group. We were running an anarcho-feminist festival in Ukraine, and one of the main aims was to connect this West 
East Europe. But, yeah, because nobody need visa to Ukraine. From, in that point, Russia, Belarus, nobody needed visa in that point to Ukraine. That's why we thought it's a good place, actually, to meet. And we kept doing it also during the war already. We managed to have a couple of times people from Kazakhstan, from Armenia, from Georgia, from more like East places. But the problem is that we don't have resources and they don't have resources money-wise. So every time to meet, we need somebody on the West to ask to pay for their tickets. That's why we are difficult to build these connections. And in the beginning, we were telling that with Russia, Belarus, we are also losing connections. But in the beginning of war, one of the first reactions, one of the first solidarity came from Kurdistan very fast. And I mean, also people in um, more like Georgia, Kazakhstan, they supported other people who went there, mostly from Russia, but also from Ukraine a bit. And I know for Belarus, but... Uh, yeah, they don't have money to send us really, but they support with actions there because there are things which they can do there. So we have it, but it's not very spread. It. And even far, more far away, it's about resources always. I meet people from these far away countries in Europe. I mean, in, in the EU. In, in Ukraine, it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah. So with. You want to finish, and I just say a couple of more things, and then you can finish. So I want to remind you once again on our email list. Um, we would like to extend our network we already have with people who would like to support us. So it's not like just about receiving information, rather than contributing, sharing, spreading, counter the counter propaganda. So we are really relying actually on everybody supporting in that. Um, especially on the question of countering the Russian propaganda. And yeah, thank you all. Thanks. Yeah, I want to remind you on the um, event of the Solidarity Collectives, where this is going to be a bit more practical and different um, actors who are supporting practically in the last one and a half year will be there and um, share their experiences. It is at eight in the book fair, like in the ICE Arena. And we also have a table in the book fair in case you want to give comments and so on and so forth. You can try to flip our tables if you're like so flipped in your life. Um, but we are there and so the conversation can continue in case you're interested. Yeah. And we want to thank the, for the translation. Thanks that you were all here. And uh, thanks for live streaming and bringing this to a wider audience than we are here and recording the audio so we're going to can put it online. And thanks for the amazing moderation of this discussion. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. 